Hello, welcome for another Café Rollist. It's been a couple of weeks. Is my microphone on? Yes, it seems to be. And today I am joined from the US by a fellow podcaster. Could you briefly introduce yourself? Good well, it's morning for me. Good morning. I'm Matt Jay. I'm uh, based in uh, Kansas City, uh, Missouri. I run the Diceology podcast. I've done a couple of zines for Kickstarter, and you may find my name as a contributing author and a bunch of different games scattered around. Yeah, you got a very impressive uh, resume. I was having a look at, at your website and uh, some Pathfinder, some Cortex Prime. <laughs> yes, I think uh, I actually got my start with Fate. Uh, I did Clockwinders for Fate Evil Hat uh, some years ago. Um, and then uh, I wrote Superheroes for Cortex Prime. And the most recent thing I worked on was Pathfinder. I did uh, uh, two or three monsters in the uh, Mwanji Expanse uh, book for Pathfinder. And I worked on uh, two cities uh, in there as well. So uh, that was fun. That was a good project. Cool. Are you still freelancing or do you concentrate on your own project nowadays? Uh, I still have a couple of freelancing things happening, but I'm starting to work more on my own projects. I've got a couple of works in progress. Um, I did a zine off of Kickstarter about superheroes uh, using Champions Now, and that got exciting for me. So I want to turn that into a standalone superheroes game, and I'm probably going to do it in the apocalypse world engine powered by the apocalypse um or at least that's what i'm uh outlining it in right now uh, but i think that's a nice fit and uh and i like playing around with dice pools so uh that's probably the biggest thing i'm working on right now so is that lifted yes that is lifted yes so uh, we've got a, a couple of ice-breaking questions because this is sort the stream is sort of a spin-off of my main show, which I used to record in person. And because I could not record in person anymore because of COVID, although today in the UK it's Freedom Day, which is <clears throat> a big cause of celebration. Uh, but one of my first ice-breaking question is, uh, what does your routine look like at the moment is it uh are you are you locked down are you enjoying the outdoor as it was it impacted in any way what, what's a what's a normal day in uh in the life of mad j zero wow a normal day uh so uh i've been working from home long before covid happened i'm uh, uh, also a software engineer um so most of the time I've been working re remote for clients. I have a couple of software products out there that I license out. Um, for me, it's it's usually four or five o'clock start. Oh, wow. Uh, I, well, I can't help it. I just wake up, right? And sometimes I just can't go back to sleep. Uh, that's my military service uh, cutting in. Uh, I'll get up, I'll see what's going on in the world, news, email, I'll make some coffee. Um, my son's been going to school virtually, and so uh, I'll check in on him and uh, figure out what he's going to have for breakfast. Uh, I have a giant dog. I let her out back. Uh, but after my first pot of coffee, I start to settle in because it's still early, and I usually get the bulk, the best of my work done those first four hours while everyone is still asleep and everything is still quiet. Uh, so there are usually two time blocks I have in it at about two or three hours long. And I'll knock out some great work before everyone is up and running. Um, then I get him going at school. Um, I start thinking about lunch, uh, gym, uh, and then engaging social media stuff. And then usually by the afternoon, it's whatever I want. Uh, sometimes it's games, sometimes it's game prep stuff. Uh, I have a lawn, which is crazy. And sometimes it's mowing the lawn, which sucks. I hate it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's good for me, so I do it. <laughs> so my job is an architect, and uh, it's just I worked for a lot of people, especially before I moved to London. Uh, I used to do a lot of single-family houses, and you know it was a dream. Everybody want their house with their garden and so on. And it was in Belgium, and uh, yes. If you don't have a garden, you are you are really looked down upon. Uh, living in an apartment, air quote, is something very bad. But no one maintains 
you know, everybody hates that and does nothing with their garden. So there's really, really no point. I'm very happy to be in a city here in London, and I don't, I don't have a, a loan. <laughs> I mean, I'm not judging, but I find it funny because you say you hate maintaining it. And I just go to the local park and it's much, it looks much better than I could ever have my loan to be. So, uh, so yeah. No, we, we have this weird thing going on. If it was up to me, I would just let it go. But you have these neighbors right here. Oh, yeah. So I live, yeah, I have a cul-de-sac. So I have my neighbors and uh, especially since COVID, I think the hobby or the thing to do is to get out in manicure your lawn and i hate that i'm like i'm not that's not you know it's nice but i'm not trying to have it exactly this high and exactly this green and even all the way around and, but these guys are doing that and uh <laughs> so they're kind of setting the bar i at least have to keep it you know tame and so uh yeah, my, yeah, it sucks. I don't like it. <laughs> my, my mom's was was maintaining her front lawn so poorly that now the her neighbor does it when he does his own <laughs> because he was so tired. But it's, but <laughs> even in park, it's really in public park nowadays. Uh, I think it's it's quite good. I personally love the look of it, especially now. Uh, they they have high grass, and rather than have to cut the lawn all the time, like you know English garden and this sort of things. Now they got sections which are made to be kept wilder, and uh, you can have insects and animals which dwell into that. And it's you, they pick the. I'm not a landscape. Uh, I don't work in landscape, but I do know that they pick uh, what is called, you know, seeds and stuff which grow in a specific way so that it looks wild, but it's not gonna spread all over the place. So maybe maybe you can. Uh, launch a fashion in your neighborhood of that. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. It's not poorly maintained. It's ecological. It's environmentally right. friendly. I'm um, not right. wasting water and resources. And it's uh, an habitat. Yeah, that's the word. An habitat for the fauna and flora uh, local to our area. So you can you can get around things uh, like that. Uh, so uh, your po- your podcast is Dysology. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I have not listened to it yet because I've had a, a wild couple of weeks and I don't even remember how we organized this specific interview, but I love <laughs> having people on the microphone and just talking to them. So uh, how did you launch Dysology? How did it start? It, uh, it was like two years ago. Uh, I just checked this morning because I wasn't sure. I remember the first year anniversary. Uh, but I wasn't quite sure how old it was, and uh, it was two. It's two years old in uh, May. I launched it in 2019. I think uh, I play a lot of I play a lot of games across the spectrum, from indie games, story games. Uh, I've done some LARPs. I do all the tried games. I don't have that box that I only do these games. I it, they're all games. I want to play them all. <laughs> But I well, we all like, know the name of that box. Often it's a red yeah. box. It's got three letters yeah, you know, on it. Yeah, it's got yeah, and a, and a big giant monster. Because I don't know if I can say what kind of monster it is. <laughs> um, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought there were a lot of games, a lot of people uh, that are underrepresented. Uh, I wasn't hearing on other podcasts. Uh, folks that make games go. Um, I think it is one thing, and I'm not anti-game designer, I think it's one thing to celebrate game designers. But I think there are a lot of games that also need mentioning, and a lot of people, facilitators, the folks that make game conventions go, whether it's a hundred people convention or multi-thousand people, um, those folks that make those spaces happen and go, they're worth having conversations with. Um, Folks who are breaking into games and they've got their first game out there having those conversations. Uh, people that just play games, uh, those conversations are fantastic, right? And uh, so I did that. I, I started uh, talking to different folks, bringing them on the podcast. My son was one of them. Uh, he's the first guest in the first episode. Oh, that's uh, we great. Were playing, yeah, we were playing, uh, I think we were moving over from Traveler to BXD and D at the time. And so we talked through some of those things. And it just st- it just kept going. It just kept going after that. Um, I've had some incredible conversations with folks. Um, something sometimes it's not even about games. It's about what games mean in their lives, uh, how uh, how uh, they go about their days or their their lives. Uh, 
game adjacent. Um, there are some that game is a big part of their family. Um, we go off in this wild, crazy spaces. I remember having a, a conversation uh, about consciousness, right? Uh, what is it and what does it mean? And what does it have to do with gaming, right? But the conversation <laughs> went that way and uh, and it was fantastic. So um, it's funny I'm, how I'm hoping I did. Go ahead. It's funny, I was thinking about consciousness yesterday because I, I was re remembering, I, I don't even know why, but I was remembering a conversation I had with um, uh, Lloyd Gann uh, from here in London, an yeah. uh, uh, awesome uh, guy. And we, we had this conversation on my show about immersion. And he was telling me how, well, what is an immersion anyway? You, you're, not, you're never fully immersed because you're still aware you are in the game, but... I don't know why I was thinking again about this conversation yesterday, and I was thinking, yeah, but it's like consciousness. You you don't define. <laughs> it's difficult to define consciousness. So what is immersion? Are you ever immersed in, in whatever? Even if you are in reality doing something, your mind might be wandering uh, about something right. else. So it's 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 all uh, it's all on the spectrum, uh, I guess. Uh, so so yeah, it's your show sounds like uh, it, it's very appealing to me because it, it seems like we're a bit li likely minded, in the sense that. I find there's a lot of excellent podcast shows, but often they they tend to to look inward towards the hobby or specific game or specific aspects. And what I like about the hobby is how it connects different interests, different people, so that it could be right. really outward looking and, and connecting with uh, connecting the dot between a, a lot of things which seems uh, unrelated at once, like like cooking and tabletop roping, but you're having a lot of people around the table and, and you, you bake a cake and you, you prepped a, a game session for them. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, um, and again, a lot of the conversations I've had, I think we veer off from gaming pretty quickly. Or even the, the commonality that we all have as gamers. Uh, one of the questions I usually ask everyone is, uh, what was early gaming like for them? And uh, you'll find a lot of us, uh, depending on age brackets, we start with the same three or four games, uh, and then we move in different other directions from there. Um, it's it's fun to see across generations how uh, gaming is um, not taboo, but uh, it's not it's not something we come out in the public with like football. I, I played uh, freshman football and uh, I, you know, when, when that conversation comes up, I have no hesitation to say, oh yeah, I played football freshman year. But I, I'm, you know, depending on the people I'm sitting with, I might not always say, oh yeah, I was a big D&D &D player in uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, right? I mean, I do that. I'm judging the room, trying to figure out what kind of response I'm going to get. But I think nothing of uh, aligning myself with the sport and that seems to continue a little bit. Um, and that's interesting to see in these conversations that that's something we all have in common, uh, no matter who I'm talking to. So. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, with the internet and to some extent, you know, people have been talking that uh, stuff like D&D are becoming more popular and uh, there's such a wide audience nowadays and even geeky stuff in general, like, I don't know, superhero movies or the Lord of the Rings and th this sort of things. And then you, I mean, uh, up to uh, a couple years ago, you showed up at your office <laughs> to work and you look at all your colleagues, they're all engineers <laughs> or doing that stuff, uh, project managers, secretaries, graphic designers, and so on. And you realize that, no, actually, most of the people they are interested into uh, football, aka okay, soccer here, uh, uh, cars, uh <laughs> the cycling and yeah all this stuff which is way way more mainstream still today than all our geeky stuff and you still feel quite isolated when when you're like so what have you been doing this weekend well <laughs> i've been doing this thing we're sitting around the table usually now they they mention D and then it becomes even more awkward because you're they don't like, really expect you to explain more about it, but you feel compelled right. to say, like, yeah, it's like D&D, &D, but it's not D&D. &D. <laughs> no, and that's true, too. A lot of times they'll come back with either uh, like a board game uh, that they'll compare to D&D &D, and you're trying to manage that space, or they have uh, no concept and uh, trying to get their head around that. Uh, what are you talking about? Um, the most fantastic thing, this is how I knew 
that uh, our gaming has uh, made some inroads into becoming mainstream. Uh, during COVID, the last November, I took the family on an RV trip just to get out of the city, to get out of being in the bubble. Uh, we took an RV trip uh, from Kansas City uh, out to New Mexico. Um, maybe three or four day trip, road trip. Uh, in Texas, we stopped at an RV camp and uh, I went in to get food at the little uh, bar and grill that they had there. And there were two truckers in there, uh, truck drivers in there, and they made some space for me to come in, get my food and that kind of thing. And while we're waiting, we're having a conversation. Where are you from? Uh, why are you traveling through here? Uh, that kind of stuff. And then we got into, you know, what do you like to do, right? And they answered first and they started with card games. And uh, so we're talking about card games. And then that turns into D and D. And again, they bring it up. I didn't bring it up first. And uh, and I'm like, wow, okay, right? You guys play D and D, right? And then I'm thinking they must mean like a video game or a board game. No, they actually play like fifth edition D and D. So now we're having that conversation. Two more folks jump in the conversation, and I thought, wow, this is crazy. You know, I'm here are strangers. I don't know out in the middle of Texas, and they all play D and D. And the truck drivers. One guy's a mail carrier guy. Uh, the other person's a week staff there, and we're just all having this conversation about D and D. Meanwhile, in the background, the election results are happening, and nobody cares. We're talking about D and D right now, so now it's fantastic to me. Yeah, this sounds great. Uh, so, Diceology, I'm going to listen to my f first episode soon. Where should I start? Is there an episode you're especially proud of or you think it's especially representative or not representative at all or is there one i should avoid I, because you hate the sound on this one or any <laughs> i uh, so i think if you go from beginning to the end you will see the evolution of uh my method uh my interview process and techniques so i like to think the podcast sounds better and is produced better today than it was two years ago we all but, hope uh, all the podcasters hope <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of learning in there right there's a lot of different software changes and stuff so like much that. even today i'm still yeah i'm still refining things and trying to figure out how do i shorten the editing time right so uh the most the i would say i would start with and i'm pulling it up now i think it's episode 13 it's uh uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, where is it? I just had it up here because I was looking at these. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, episode 13 when I talked with uh, Mike Pondsmith at Gen Con. In oh, nice. 2019. Uh, for me, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I have a great fondness for that episode. Uh, I remember playing Cyberpunk. Uh, Man, I don't even, uh, I, maybe I was 18, 19, something like that. I don't, I, I think I was out of high school, but I remember picking it up. Um, I think it was out about the time Shadowrun was out and I can only buy one or the other, right? And oh. I decided I would go with Cyberpunk, right? Um, we had uh, several games with that. Uh, and uh, I don't remember when it occurred to me that uh, Mike Pondsmith was a black guy, right? Uh, but then that, that changed my headspace. Uh, I never even thought about race or anything with uh, role-playing games. And they were games we sat down and played. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I figured that out. And I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is something I could do, right? Um, and uh, so he's been big in my head uh, over the years, uh, as well as other... Uh, uh, people of color, uh, game designers. And uh, setting that interview up, uh, first I was I was amazed that they, they granted me some time because uh, he was gonna be at Gen Con uh, signing uh, the new edition of uh, Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk Red. I think they had the jump st Jumpstart kit out. And uh, when I got there, the booth was filled. They had a line popping in around it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I, I feel bad because I'm going to walk him off from here and we're going to go have an interview for about an hour or two. He's not going to be here. And these folks are going to be standing in line waiting to interact with him. And I feel like I'm stealing like candy from a baby. And I felt bad. It was awful. 
but that interview was fantastic. He was easy to talk to. We talked about a lot of stuff. We go all over the place. And uh, uh, I have a, yeah, I have a great fondness for, for that interview. It's, it's really nice. You know, my experience as a podcaster in tabletop RPG is everybody's so approachable. I mean, of course, people have, can be busy and you, you don't have access to them because they, they got so many demands to be on shows and so on. But when you run into them at conventions, they, they, uh, everybody I ran into was very approachable, very welcoming and, and kind. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very special, you know, that the bad thing is that we, we cannot talk about it as much as we wished with our colleagues at work because it's not mainstream enough. The good bit is that it's a tightly knit community and yeah, usually people are, are easy to engage with. It's funny you mentioned. No, I agree. He had a. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say he had a, a great support staff. That's what I remember the most. That uh, as much fun and how easy it was to talk to him. Uh, the support staff that he had there, they were fantastic. And transitioning him out, bringing him back in, um, making sure they were engaging with me and also the customer base at the same time. Uh, in the small space that they had at Gen Con, and I recognize that. Uh, so that's kind of a bar in my head that uh, they were able to make sure he was uh, where he needed to be, and they could uh, bridge the gaps where he wasn't around or anything. And uh, that was fantastic. That's an interesting job. I'd be curious to hear an interview with someone like that. I should seek out someone who did that. Uh, uh, be because, yeah, it's... You know, it's uh, it's personable skills, but at the same time, it's time management skill to be in charge of making sure that someone is where they need to be at the time they need to be, and at the same time, you know, they they are not overburdened. You know, it's a it's a it's quite a line yeah. to walk uh, to to manage uh, someone doing something like that. Right. So, uh, but uh, yeah, you mentioned Cyberpunk. Uh, actually, the, the my last interview, the one I'm editing at the moment, what was with someone who started with Cyberpunk. It's Danny Ware, and she she even wrote a, a trilogy of novels inspired by her character in in Cyberpunk, the Echo trilogy with Echo Rising, Echo Burning, and, and Echo Endgame. Uh, do, do you think what you played with Cyberpunk would be good novel material? Um, not my early years of cyberpunk. I think we emulated a lot of movies, right? Um, I, uh, I'm curious today. So cyberpunk today feels very nostalgia, right? What I want to know is what happens after cyberpunk, because we didn't get the whole of the cyberpunk genre uh, once we move forward in time, right? We have giant corporations but they don't have standing militaries or anything like that, right? And they're not uh, world dominating or anything like that, right? Um, so I wonder what happens next. We have a little bit of um, dystopian stuff and uh, disparity and in income and status, but it's not at the levels of some of the stuff we've read in cyberpunk. I don't feel that way. Um, but I'm curious what, what genre comes in gaming after cyberpunk, right? Yeah, I guess it's sort it, it reminds me a bit of Metal Gear Solid, which on one hand, on if you had mm. to put it on a timeline, it's before cyberpunk because the, the, the whole society is not to the level of technology uh, that you see in in Metal Gear Solid. But in Metal Gear Solid, you have, you have a lot of the subject of groups of um, private militaries and mercenaries and then being engaged in covert operations for different uh, groups of interest, which could be corporations. So I guess you could take cyberpunk and, and push it a bit forward in, well, a, a more, with more open conflict of bigger scale and uh, the battlefield are, are with groups of people who are yeah, more like well, what we see today and what's described in Metal Gear, which is, yeah, mercenaries working with whoever pays the most, which also, to be fair, it's something, it's not something new, it's something which existed for, for millennia when you, you read about 
uh, the Roman Empire, uh, at some point they, they had people, right. they, had, they had German mercenaries which they failed to pay and the German mercenaries said, you guess what, we're going to go on the other side because they happen to be air quote mm -hmm. Germans and we're going to fight alongside them because you didn't pay us. So, so yeah, that, that's not something new. Huh? No, not at all. And we know here in America, we've got private military companies. Uh, so that, you know, that's mercenaries made corporate, right? Yeah, and I think in Europe people tend to to fail to realize that it, it that at least maybe I don't know about companies so much, but yeah, I was born and raised in in Belgium, and Belgium has a a lot of uh, career militaries who went on private and were even involved in very uh, well despicable operations including the assassination of uh, political figures in in Africa on, on top of the crimes committed by the the Belgian government uh, in the 19th centuries but uh, yeah again again that's something a lot of pilots uh, for instance and uh, even early World War II uh, I, I got a special interest in the Spanish Civil War uh, there were a lot of private contractors there as well as as well as militant who went on, on their own. And uh, yeah, I don't know where we landed here. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean, right? We start off one way, but we end up someplace else in these conversations. And that's fantastic for me. I like it. Well, the odds with me of landing in the Spanish Civil War are quite high most of the time. <laughs> So I just go with it, man. Don't fight it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go. Let's come back to, to you. So so lifted superheroes. Uh, tell me what what's lifted and what what's your USP beyond superhero tabletop top roping? And what's what's the thing that lifted has that the the other systems don't have or settings? So um, uh, lifted. So I try to. So every every year, uh, Kickstart has done their zine project. So lifted is my second zine project. And I happened to be in the superhero mode at the time, uh, coming off of Cortex, uh, writing supers for Cortex. Uh, I was playing Champions Now, which I super love. Uh, Ron Edwards wrote that uh, off the hero game system. Um, I played a lot of Champions when I was younger. And so I like his revision uh, or his reboot of that system using Champions Now. Um, I read a lot of X-Men. Uh, X-Men is deep, deep, deep in my DNA. Um, the comics, um, I'm frustrated with the X-Men movies, but only because I have all that comic book baggage, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks. Yeah. So a lot of folks love the movies and I'm not bashing them. It's just that it's hard for me to square the two because I have all that lore from the comics. It's funny. I'm um, sort of the, uh, <laughs> what I find funny with the movies, uh, I really love the first two really. Yeah. And I, I think now people tend to hate on those movies because of all the movies which followed and they sort of right. forgot how much they brought to superheroes on screen and how much the MCU might not be there without the two X-Men movies, the first two right. at least. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a pity that it was driven into the ground beating the dead horse. I mean, we, we had a yeah. few nice late additions like Logan for sure. So it was, it right, was all worth sure. it. But but yeah, I, f I think the vibe now is more hating those movies than, li than liking them. <laughs> I think the running joke is that you always end up on a train for some reason uh, in the X Men movies. I think uh, uh, that's true, but I do that in games, right? If there's a fight, I want I want stuff to be moving. So if it's not the highway or plane, it's a train. So it's so weird because the X Men when I, when I was a kid, so. Uh, I was not that exposed to comics uh, because in Europe you got other types of graphic novels, bande dessinée, but X-Men was this huge license. I mean, they were like the most famous character in comics, definitely with Marvel. And now they're sort of the underdogs in sort of in IPs. And yeah, and it's all the other yeah. characters yeah. which are bigger. And it's, it's quite a feat that Marvel pulled off with their back catalog. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird to me to see them make the transition to the big screen. Um, I'm not a director. I'm I'm certainly an armchair quarterback, 
I feel like uh, we figured some things out with the MCU, the current MCU, that we didn't know when we were doing the X-Men movies, but we should have known better watching the Batman movies, right? Uh, I think we know that when you start to put five, six, seven different protagonists on the screen, uh, they're not getting a lot of character development time, right? That's a lot to ask somebody to take in. But if you break them up, Captain America had a movie, the Hulk had a movie, Thor had a movie, right? Before we bring them all together, right? That works way better, right? People can pick and choose where they're getting in at and then watch the big ensemble cast and they go back to the individual ones, just like we do with comic books, right? Um, I think if I had anything to say about the X-Men movies is that they try to cram too many characters in or character cameos. And I'm like, you could have just done a movie about four of the characters. And maybe that's a book, maybe that's the X-Men blue team, right? Um, and then if you want to bring the other ones in, right? Maybe you do an X-Men, separate X-Men movie, but it's an X-Men red team, right? And then maybe there's a bigger thing that you bring them all together in. Because there's a lot of X-Men, right? And you can't show them all in a movie, right? Uh, there's way too many, so. Yeah, I think there's also this weird, I think DC still got this issue to some extent, but the, the thing which really lingered with the X-Men movies that there was sort of this embarrassment about what they were. So it was, oh right. yeah, with the X-Men, but we, we don't wear bright colors. We don't do the Lycra because it's embarrassing. And somehow Marvel Cinematic Universe, they managed to say, okay, no, we can have Captain America with its colors, Iron Man with the colors. Uh, and they're, they're sort of more accepting of their own license while, yeah, especially DC itself is like, yeah, it's it's Superman, but, but um, you know, we're doing Superman, but it's edgy. Don't worry. It's not the Superman like in the comic <laughs> books. It's not a thing for kids. And it's like, be proud of your character. You should be a fan of your right, character. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I'm not a fan of Superman. I know a lot of people are, are going to hate that. I'm not, but... I, I get Superman, right? And uh, when they rebooted him and and, and uh, did what they did to him in the movies, I'm like, ooh, folks will be madder than I am. And I'm not, I'm just not a big fan. That's not Superman, right? That's not the ideal. There's edginess and twisting things a little bit. I think they went too hard on the edge and that's not the Superman we know and love, right? Um, yeah, it's Maybe not... you can, go ahead. It's, it's... I mean, whatever you decide to do, you should go along with what it is. So yeah. if it's Deadpool, you do a Deadpool movie. If it's Superman, you right. do a Superman movie. If it's a Captain America, do a Captain America movie. But you don't don't take Superman and try to make a Batman movie out of it. It's that's where right. that's why right. it won't be working. Or or take take Wolverine and try to do uh, I don't know something else <laughs> with it. Just <laughs> just, just be understand what your character is about and 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 go for it. Right. No, I agree. I agree. So, but lifted. <laughs> so. Hmm. Yeah. So with lifted, um, like I said, I have a lot of X Men history. Uh, I fell off the wagon. I don't know when, uh, but I would pick up X Men comics every now and again. Um, but I've been frustrated with them. And maybe it's because I'm getting older and they're getting away from the thing that drew me in. Um, superhero comics in general, uh, especially when they do reboots and things like that, I feel like we have this tale that we keep pulling along. Like our super soldier programs always start in World War II. Um, and I'm like, how? what if? What would a superhero world look like if we didn't have to drag all that history, right? Um, so I started with uh, everything I liked about the X-Men, everything I liked about Wildcats. And uh, maybe we don't know how folks are developing powers yet. Um, we can figure that out in our games, right? And this is the other thing I like is that if, if we don't try to answer everything in the setting, leave some stuff to play with without me adding in a meta plot, uh, I feel like our games are better. Everyone's game is going to be different, right? They'll get to different answers, but I think that's fine. That's okay. So Lifted for me is kind of a homage, uh, an homage to uh, the X-Men, uh, but starting in current times, not World War II. Um, maybe there's three, or three to five years where folks are figuring out, uh, folks are developing these powers, um, and 
organizations, government uh, are trying to figure out how to deal with that, right? Uh, can we co-op some of this? Can we compromise, work with some of these folks? Uh, how do we get a handle on some of this? And it's at scale. It could be, I've got several different games happening. Some of them have taken the local scale, like uh, the neighborhood of Chicago, right? Or the city of Chicago. Some are taking wider regional stands. How do we uh, police and get a handle on these lifted folks? Where are they coming from? How are they developing these powers? Um, and uh, and then run from there. Uh, that's, that's the seed for me is that uh, uh, when the setting opens, we don't know how humans, some humans are developing these powers and everyone's scrambling to figure out what to do with that. What to, how does that change the status quo? Uh, can we stop it? So so you're, it's open ended, and you you don't have you you don't have the issue of having this uh, pre established narrative that you have with Marvel and DC or so or even all the license. So you are there to find out. Okay, is it going to turn into Jupiter Ascending, or is it going to turn like right. more? Uh, MCU or more X-Men because you, you were talking about too many characters at the end when well not the end because it's been a while now but and it's still going on but when I was reading the X-Men comics uh, at some point there were too many mutants <laughs> in the world <laughs> in the comics and the thing I the thing where, where I really fell off the wagon was uh, they had this big event yeah House of M and I thought it was a good reset yes. to say, okay, no more mutants, yeah. and then there should be not few. And then each time you would buy comics after that, it was like, oh, it turns out that uh, Longshot still got his power. It turns out that Jubilee still got her power. And in the end, it was like, does anyone <laughs> lost their powers here? It, it really doesn't feel right, like that. Else. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I What's agree. the point? Uh, <laughs> you had a good idea. Funny, Just funny. follow your idea. <laughs> That's the other thing is my thoughts uh, out of Champions Now, uh, Ron Edwards talks about it at length, that uh, start with what's happening right now. And uh, you could always backfill stuff in your yes. game. And I'm only talking about games. You can always backfill stuff as you need to. And you can add things at the front as you need to. Start with what's happening right now and play out from there. Um, the other thing I did is I did not include, uh, I think the driving force in Lifted is, what does the X-Men look like if there's no Magneto and there's no Xavier, right? There are no leaders, right? And again, we're in a game. So then the characters have to decide what are they going to do, right? There's no X, there's no Charles showing up to say, hey, come join my team, right? And Magneto is not doing the same. But you still have uh, folks out there with different agendas, clashing agendas, right? Uh, what is what does your player characters do? What do they want to do? What are they going to do with the situation? And uh, and that was more interesting to me. Um, and in a lifted setting, I spent a lot of time on the villains, right? Because uh, they're going to bring they're the uh, they're the antagonists, and I want them to bring and be active and make the the heroes' lives uh, miserable. And uh, that's yeah, that's what I hope to bring uh, in the lifted setting. Uh, so just. Do you have a, a a tone in mind? Like, is it because X Men to some level they, they got f those fantastical power, but still felt somewhat grounded. While right. you take things like uh, like again more DC, it's more flashy colors, or it's more on the legend scale of, of powers and and stories. And then you, you can go even to stuff like well, Batman to some extent or the, the Devil, right. where it's, it's really a uh, street level sort of, of action most of the time. Uh, how do you see the, the action and the tone of your game? Do you encourage a specific tone or do you keep that open-ended as well? I think I keep that open-ended, but it may be, it may be, uh, uh, it may have some limits. Like, I use Champions Now as the, the example setting. And you can certainly be street level uh, like Batman and you can, yeah, you could probably get to low powered Avengers level as starting characters uh, with, with Champions. So I don't think you're doing a Thor level character, right? Um, but I think you could certainly get an Iron Man-ish kind of character out of there. I think if you know the rule set pretty well, you can probably cheat at a at an <laughs> iron man type character right um 
So in between there, I think folks will fall out because we all like different scales of superhero games. And I didn't want Lifted to box you in. Um, if I have my druthers, right, uh, I would like to take that setting and bring it across different role-playing systems and let it play out differently in each system, right? So for example, if you do a Lifted with a d and BX or D20 system, I think that feels more like uh, heroes bagging villains, turning them in and trying to get control of uh, the chaos that they bring, right? Uh, which is very different than say, uh, maybe an apocalypse world style game where you just have these situations that are snowballing and spiraling out of control and folks have different drama levels happening there. Uh, that's interesting to me to see how different game systems uh, implement or manifest that system rather than trying to make them all the same, right? Um, that's something I would, I'm interested in doing. Yeah, a long time ago, uh, uh, since then my tastes have changed in uh, in role-playing game, but at some point I wanted to do a, a Marvel campaign, but more leaning towards X-Men. And I'm not sure what system I would have used. Uh, I'm not a big fan of GURPS, but something in that vein a bit, uh, something which really balanced things out. And at the same time, the, I mean, something which codified the level of powers, and based on that, uh, you can have very high discrepancies between the players, because I find that's how the X-Men are uh, to some extent, mm -hmm. and have the players roll randomly what powers they have, and then they have to manage <laughs> with the situation and survive, and sort of the uh, slightly railroady aspect, or railroady aspect of, of the campaign would have been that Earlier in the game, the first help they sort of they would have received, uh, they would have probably run into the taskmaster because I I love the concept of so that that for people who are not aware the taskmaster in some form is in the the Black Widow movie now, but originally the character is the person who trains the minions for all the other villains. And I just love that concept. So the players right, would have I love that concept. would have ended up with him, and he would have trained them. And say, okay, and you do some missions for me. And the missions would have been like often in comics. Okay, you're gonna fight the X Men. So they're the good guys. You are not exactly the bad guys either at this point. But you've got your first encounter with the other good guys is a fight. <laughs> because that's often like that. The Avengers meet the X-Men and they fight. That's the first thing and they, they fight, do. Yes, and yes. then they become friends. But really have the aspect of, okay, your power are whatever. But if they are great powers, very powerful powers, they're dangerous until you train into them. And if they're small powers, you've got a better control of them. So actually you can be more... It can be useful earlier in the game, but really have the aspect of, oh, you don't have a X-Men suit made by Reed Richards yet. So when you do your thing with the flame, you end up in your underwear. You really have the aspect right. of, okay, we're building up by creating your own organization or joining one and starting to get the training, the equipment, and, and we have this really build up of, oh, wait, we're on top of something now, or we're part of something bigger. What does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> so your system, you, you mentioned playing your setting with different systems, but your own system at this point, how would you describe it? Uh, so right now, and I've just been playing with other systems, um, Vincent Baker did an essay, uh, I think in seven parts, on uh, lumplygames.com, uh, where he talks about using the Apocalypse World engine to outline, playtest, and build out your game design. And so I started going through that with lifted supers of mine. And so my initial thought is, if I'm going to build it, uh, the first incarnation is probably uh, powered by the powered by the apocalypse system, um, and then from there I might look at BX next, um, and then who knows after that? Uh, Cortex uh, is a, is an obvious choice. Um, I like Cortex because you can get that balance of uh, Hawkeye and Thor being in the same game and equally contributing. Uh, they do a great job of balancing that out between superheroes. 
I only played one Cortex so far, it's uh, Tales of Xadia, but I was really impressed by it. I thought it, it struck a very nice balance between something, I quote, traditional with, with skills and so on, and something more narrative with PBTA. I thought it was a very interesting balancing act, and I, I really you... loved how, at least in Tales of Xadia, because that's my confusion with Cortex, things seem to be quite different depending what you t pick in the toolset. But right. what I really like is that it encourages you to, oh, if you have a weapon which gives you a bon, which is part of your identity, which gives you a bonus, or if you have a background which is part of your identity when you do an action, it encourages the players and the game master to, to sh sh refer to it, so bring it back. Right. So it's not something sitting on your character sheet and it's just a generic term like, okay, you can pick locks it's no you've been part of the guild of the thief of the city of whatever so when you okay i'm doing this because i've been part of the guild of the thing even if you just name it it already it <laughs> colors the experience no i love that i love when that happens yes all right um uh, we're getting close to the end is there something else you wish to talk about uh, before we we part uh no this is all organic for me i uh, even my show uh i have a short list but i know the conversations are going to go where they go and i just follow them so I had, a, I had a question actually what's what's next for lifted what are your do you have deadlines or milestone or people things that people should look forward to or people should go to the backer kit oh, to support it yes definitely go to the backer kit uh, right now, one of the tiers was uh, playing games uh, in the lifted setting, and those games are happening right now. Oh, cool. Um, there are, I've got three different games happening of lifted. Uh, they're small two to three player groups. Uh, out of those games, I will pull the best of villains out, and they'll make it into the lifted book, uh, the lifted setting book. Um, I will deliver that Z. August and September uh, this year. And then after that, uh, I think I'm going full mode into developing Lifted to be a standalone game. And uh, ideally, maybe by summer, uh, I'll have next summer, uh, 2022, I'll launch a Kickstarter with uh, Lifted. Now, I'm, I've been playing Lancer, the RPG with my son. And so I've been kind of inspired by what they've done on the web support side. Um, they've got apps that help you through building your mechs, building your character, uh, running different sessions. So my dream would be to have uh, some web support akin to that for Lifted. Oh, cool. I think uh, that, I hope that's a trend. Uh, I think that's fantastic, especially as we start to play more games online. Uh, or bring laptops to the table to play games. So I'm thinking about what does that look like? How can that be helpful? I don't want it to be clunky and in the way. Uh, but the folks that make Lancer, they did a bang up job uh, supporting their role playing game through a web app. So, and we use that. We're sitting at the dining room table. He's got his laptop up. I have mine up. Um, and we're just playing that game. He's making his rolls and checks from his laptop. Uh, I'm running the encounter for mine, and I love that idea. So. I think it's building up this idea. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't like saying this person or that organization started a uh, Think X, but uh, the, my first exposure to this sort of things was with Fourth Edition Dungeons and Dragons with their character builder, and it, it makes such a difference for me as someone who was not so keen on D and D, and I ended up Four E is my favorite. And, and now D and D Beyond is quite like that, and at least in clubs here yeah. in London, you see people with their tablet, and they they got they got a, <laughs> an account for the whole club, so they share the the supplements and, and so on uh, in a legal fashion. By the way, uh, it's uh, all approved by Wizards right, of the right. Coast. Uh, but uh, so I think I think yeah, there's definitely a, a place for that. I'd really like to try Lancer. I've heard it was influenced by Fourth Edition D and D, which surprised me. But uh, yeah, I should look into this. It's it's surprisingly good. So I was jaded, uh, and uh, I'm like, ah, I don't know, right? Um, as we are as gaming nerds, this is what we do. But my son came to me, and he was like, hey, have you heard about this game? And he, he thinks it's brand new, and I'm like, no, nah, I know this game. <laughs> right? And uh, 
He's got. He's out on. There's a website that does minis for it. I can't remember the name of it right now. Hero Forge. Uh, retrograde. Uh, okay. Retrograde minis. Yeah. And so he's got that. He's sending me links and stuff. So I pick it up. I look at it. And so uh, we're gonna we're gonna play it. So I go out to itch.io, and uh, I buy the core book and the long rim supplement. And that's what we're playing. Yeah, we're playing in the long rim. And they they do a fantastic job of separating out dramatic play from tactical mech combat, and you've got ways to do both. You can have a nice stream, quick mech combat, or you could stretch it out and go full tactical with it. And we're playing through those different systems, and he's right in there, it's fantastic, I love it. Cool, uh, we've got Richard from the D20 Future Show in the chat room, and King of Demons, who uh, a supporter, and uh, having a conversation about character keepers and so on. I was about to mention that uh, the gauntlet, uh, even for indie games, which are not as complex, but the gauntlet keeps a database of Google Doc character keepers, so ways for you to easily create characters, including for masks, uh, Passion de Passiones, uh, and they're, they're fantastic tools. Uh, to be honest, the, I had to play some Call of Cthulhu uh, a while ago, and I couldn't find a proper app like that or a decent character keeper and I was just so annoyed <laughs> to create my character I was like no I don't <laughs> care about your math and then I played it and I was like doesn't mean it was math but it's useless <laughs> it's useless yeah, it <laughs> <laughs> it's completely useless the system it's just yeah okay run run a d100 I was like what for for nothing <laughs> no one cares We're anyway <laughs> uh, I will link to your project in the description of the episode I will link also to my own project on Ichio Paris Gondo the life saving magic of inventoring which by the way is set in a somewhat fan medieval fantasy world but you could definitely play it with superheroes I think it would be quite fun and interesting and I'm going to put also a link for something else since I mentioned 4th edition there's a i think it's made by a creator in southeast asia uh, i i've got a copy but i've not read it yet there's a dnd fourth edition inspired game called Gumbat banwa which looks really cool uh okay. with uh the whole lore the whole setting is uh high feet historic and tactical heroics but inspired by south asian uh tradition uh, so, so yeah, I highly recommend people check this out. And I will include a link, of course, to Diceology, which I will listen tomorrow while going Yay. to drop my son to the, the nursery. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a pure pleasure. Thanks for having me on. This was fantastic, man. I appreciate it. Well, anytime, if you have anything to, to promote, feel free to, to let me know. Uh, I would love to have you again. I will do that. All right. Thanks, Richard and King of Demons and everyone in the chat room uh, for following. Uh, you'll find this in YouTube. I need to find the, the time to upload stuff. Uh, and yeah, take care. I uh, should be back next Monday. And then we'll see. Maybe I, I will take things a bit slower because I'm sort of burning myself out recently. Uh, yeah, I released my game in French. And I'm doing a hitch funding to have it translated to Japanese. So please go follow the link uh, to Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of. I'm going to put a link in the chat room. Uh, if you don't have a copy yet, it's on sales and the proceeds are putting on the saving account to pay for a translator. So <laughs> yeah. thanks, Jay. Bye, everyone.